All right. Welcome to Squid University. Welcome to Supremacy 1914. And today we have a special topic. This topic is how to play this game. And it's a great game. It's a beautiful game. But we need to discuss why and how to play this game. So I'm at the homepage. Most people, when they start, they log in and you're in a tutorial game. And we aren't doing that. We are escaping tutorial. We are going to games. I was at the homepage. Here's games. And I'm scrolling down. And I'm looking for a game to play. Now, right now in my time zone, I'm on the eastern side of North America, EST time, and we need to pick a time in the middle of the day. Because the day one game, you can see here, day of game, it's one. I'll have a good time for day change, and that's very important. So I'm going to click join. About to join this round. And I'm going to click Minnesota. Now I'm playing as Minnesota. You can see here. I have to build recruiting offices. So that's the number one thing to do. So I, you can individually click a province, click construction, click recruiting office. Or you can control click and click all of your provinces and hit recruiting office. Every province should have a recruiting office. Now that that is done, what else are we doing? I've I made a recruiting office. I need to discuss why I have 10 provinces and what's different about those provinces. So you can see I have 10 provinces. I have one where it's double food, double food, single food, double food, single food. And I have a double wood. You get two double resources. And that is a huge indicator of what to do in this game. How you're going to play this game and those double resources is where you're going to build the majority of your other buildings with exceptions. So as you can see, the recruiting office is about to finish up. And now that they're completed, you can see I get a front report telling me I've constructed all those recruiting offices which is great. The recruiting office here will show infantry. You could see here at the double resource, it will be 22 hours before this is completed. At a single resource, you could see it's a day and 20 hours before it's completed, much longer. It's why you emphasize construction in your double resources. We'll talk about building workshops. Where are we building the workshops? Well, if you've been following along, it's at the double resources. So here is the wheat. I'm going to click workshop. Here is the double lumber. I'm going to click workshop. And workshops go all the way up to level two. And once you've built a level two workshop, you're allowed to build a factory after eight full days have, have happened. But we're only building them at the double resources. So now the workshop level one is done. I'm clicking number two. Workshop level one is done. I'm clicking number two. And as that is going, we can now build units. The workshops are done at our level two resource provinces. I'm going to hit the production button. And I'm going to build an armored car in one of them. And I'm going to build a balloon in the other. Now, why did I cho choose those? So the armored car, I go here to click at it and you can see it has hit points that are three times greater than an infantry. It has speed that is more than doubled and has a great defensive value. An infantry has five defense. This has 12. It also has good air defense, which can help in the later game. But it's nice to have for defending and reconnaissance and taking a province early on. Now I built a balloon. Why the balloon? 
So if we click the balloon, you'll see it's not great at fighting. It's okay at air. Very good cheap unit to stop and bombardment, or at least give some damage back to them. But we ha we we choose it because of the view range. You can see it's double that of an armored car. And that reminds me, we should look at an infantry. So same range as an armored car, half that of a balloon, three times less hit points, half as much speed, and they have a great defensive value relative to their attack. Now that you have that figured out, we need to manage our resources. So we start with 10, we have two double resources. And up here you could see I have grain, I have fish, I have iron ore, I have lumber, I have coal, I have oil, and I have gas. Grain and fish have a symbiotic relationship with each other. Iron ore and lumber have a symbiotic relationship with each other. Coal, oil, gas have a symbiotic relationship food, materials, energy. Now let's click the resource button. Here at the resource button, you can see I have a bunch of negatives and positives. And my goal is to minimize the negatives. So here I, you can see I'm just bleeding fish. I scroll here to have a, a less dependency, a daily consumption, and I try to make it positive. Here, the materials, it's pretty even. I'm gonna leave it alone. And now we have energy. I have a lot more oil than I do coal or gas. So I'm gonna make it less positive. And you start at 70% morale. Over the days, it's gonna become 100%. And you'll find out how well your economy is doing as the days progress. So let's look at a single resource province, this one, here we're at Walker. Here at Walker, we produce 2393 lumber. And I was like, that sounds like a lot, but it's not. Because if you look at the icon right above it, the resource details, you could see the daily consumption on the bottom. Now that daily consumption, if you were to add those numbers together, between food, materials, and energy, each of them are equivalent to 800. So 800 times three is 2,400 resources. I'm losing seven net resources from this province. And that's why I have so many negatives. So always keep that in mind. You need, your goal is to get over that threshold. 70% is not a good number at all. Now, if I look at the next icon here, morale, you could say, you could see here it has morale trending, it's rising, target morale, 98. That target morale is what I want to emphasize right now. That's as the days progress, as day change happens, that 70% will slowly move towards 98%. That's showing me that this province will be healthy and fruitful in the future. Now the stock market. The stock market, again, has split up the resources between the food, the materials, and the energy that we discussed previously. You could see here if you wanna buy at a certain amount of money, or you could sell at a certain amount of money. Now let's discuss what is going to be the priority. So in each category, there's one resource that will dominate the others. So grain, is going to be more expensive than fish, nine times out of 10. You can see here it's at 13.6. You can see the fish at 13.2. That number will drastically change with grain being higher. Here we have iron ore. You can see they're both very similar numbers. Lumber is actually higher, but iron ore is the dominant resource. Now with energy, oil is the dominant resource. Coal is usually dirt cheap, I don't know why, it's very useful. But by knowing what the dominant resource is and the non-dominant resource, prioritize 
resource management and as the game progresses, what to do. Oh, I have too much lumber. Well, maybe I should have like no lumber production and a lot of iron ore. Maybe I could sell that, go to a different market, make a lot of money. I, I don't like to sell materials, but that's a good example. If, if I start producing a lot of oil, I will try and sell that oil and buy coal and vice versa. Now that our workshops are complete, we need to debate on when to build the barracks. Now my rule of thumb is if you have a double resource that's a food, which I do here, it's a grain, here at Wheaton Valley, while up here it's a double lumber, I will build a barracks there early game. So I'm gonna go up here, click barracks, barracks is building. Now as the game progresses, you only wanna build barracks if you have about 100 to 200 net food, net grain and fish available. And why is that? Well, let's click the barracks. So here at the barracks, you could see there's construction costs, but there's also daily upkeep. And a thousand food is a lot. A thousand food is very costly. A thousand food is roughly 40 hourly upkeep of grain. And that's why I have 100 to 200 net food as my guide. That way you don't go negative. If you go negative, your provinces will get a negative modifier to the morale. Just like here, you could see the morale in this province is getting negative three from the neighbors. The neighbors don't have a high morale. So this province gets a negative morale. That will stack up fast in the late game. There, I will show you examples of how that can easily ruin your game. Now moving through time, I'm playing as Russia. My enemy Spain has lost their home region, the Iberian Peninsula. I've sacked their capital. Now look at this, here's Spain. You see that red arrow? That means they've lost that many points. They've gone down, they are bleeding. I click their country here, you can see their average morale is 53%. Remember when I was talking about that single resource province that was at 70% and I was losing seven resources? Now imagine if your entire country is under that. Spain is dead. Spain is gonna be fluttering around for a while. Spain is no longer in this game. Spain will be destroyed. Now, why did I put a barracks in my double resource province? And why do I keep saying double resource province? Well, just as I showed before, that this is taking about 22 hours to create infantry here and 120 hours to create infantry here. We'll say it's half, because it is. When I click barracks, you'll see that it makes recruitment go down by half. So pretend I have a barracks here in Wheaton Valley at my double resource and a barracks here in Moorhead. I'm getting one infantry at extra at Moorhead every day. Where here, I'm getting two infantry extra every day. The barracks has an obscenely high upkeep. By maximizing it at my double resource provinces, I'm maximizing my resources. I can build more barracks in my double resources, level one to level two, and it's way more efficient with resource management. When you invade and your enemy has a barracks, disable it. How do you disable it? Well, you go just like you would a recruiting office. You click it and you hit that disable button. A recruitment office has an upkeep of $250. That's not bad. I keep them going no matter what. I'll take a new province. I'll build it. With a barracks, I'll disable them even if it's a double resource province until that morale gets higher because the morale also dictates how fast units come out. So as we said here, it takes 22 hours to get one infantry. That's with a 30% modifier. 
negative because it's not at 100% yet. So imagine how quickly you'll start churning out units. If you can maintain your morale, choose wisely on where you build, re, uh, build workshops and barracks and factories only at double resource provinces. If you have so many resources and you're like, oh, I can't build enough at a double resource province, like show me, show, show it to me because I am still always just churning out units all the time. I always have a good workflow, a good flow through. And that's why we'll get to our next topic. Now, the next topic is about invasion. It's about defending. It's about attacking. And you can't talk about that until you figure out what in the world these lines mean. Now, these lines show where your soldiers, your armies can go. I can go and to invade this person. I can go invade this person. I can go and support my army here. I can go here and cross in this way. Oh, wait, no, I'm going this way. And that's the only means of travel is through these roads. Now with naval, it's the same thing. You can see these little dots right here. You click your army, you move and look, the dots are there. You just hover it around and you'll see the sea lane. Now that we have that figured out, we need to discuss where I'm going because I can't just stay right here. I'm going to lose if I don't attack. Now, before I can decide on attacking and defending and where my, my soldiers that I currently have, because I, I double click an in infantry, I have a hundred. Everyone who's a real player has a hundred. Now what's a real player? If I zoom out, you'll see all these names. Look at Russia tomorrow. I'm more interested about Russia yesterday, but Russia tomorrow is a human player. This country right next to Russia tomorrow, Kenora is not a human player. You can see they don't have 10, pro 10 provinces. They're an AI, they're a robot. In the early game, you don't have to worry about them. So I have Russia tomorrow as an enemy. I have an AI robot here in Kenora. I have an AI in Winnipeg. I have an AI in North Dakota. I have an AI in West Iowa. I have an AI in East Iowa. I have an AI in South Wisconsin. And I have an AI in North Wisconsin. Who did I leave out? Well, South Dakota. Now let's look at South Dakota. South Dakota is a human player. South Dakota is my target because I planned this. And when you're fighting humans, you need to see what they're doing. And my example here is look at Russia tomorrow. So if I click Russia's tomorrow's provinces, you can see he has two unknown buildings here. You're like, oh no, it's unknown. I can't see what he's building. Well, you've seen what I've been building. It's not amazing. Let's, let's figure out how he's building. He has three province, three buildings here. He has two buildings here, two, 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 one. And that shows me he's active because someone who isn't playing the game won't build any buildings. Now, who's an example of that? Here's Nebraska. I click through. He has no buildings besides the capital. You start with the capital. Now, Russia tomorrow is overbuilding, which tells me He's a threat in the early game, but if I keep doing what I'm doing, I keep expanding, I keep growing, I'm gonna beat him in the long game. Because certain players, which I've deemed as an overbuilder, just build way too much and they waste all their good resources on things that aren't necessary. Now, if you follow the double resource plan, you'll be very efficient with your resources. You won't have problems with that. So now I'm going to South Dakota. What's up with South Dakota? Here you can see South Dakota has not built anything, but South Dakota is moving. Now it's a question mark here because my line of sight from my 9th Infantry Division has two rings around it. And you can see the shade of the outer ring. And that outer ring lets me see the movement. It lets me see how long they'll take to get to a destination. But it won't tell me the exact amount. Now, if I had a balloon here as the 
vision is doubled, I could actually see how many units they are. That's why balloons are great. But him moving, but not building, makes him, me think that he's a wild card. And I've already discussed overbuilders like Russia tomorrow. Now, a wild card is someone who doesn't understand this game at all, and they will click and drag units and attack random people all the time. And that seems like a perfectly good candidate to let them do something dumb. And another thing, when invading, when planning an attack that you are going to start, you need to imagine that you've taken over their country. Now look at South Dakota. Pretend I, as Minnesota, have taken over South Dakota. I have a river here, which means I have to defend here, here, and here against a human player, Nebraska. But as I look at Nebraska, he has not been building. Will I monitor the situation and see if that changes? Yes. But that's what you need to do. You don't want to go and invade someone and realize there's someone, a very competent player, just around the bend. Because they'll just wait until you finish and then come and sweep you up. With South Dakota, what else do they have? They have North Dakota, which is an AI. I don't have to worry about them. They have North Wyoming, which is an AI. I don't have to worry about them. And then I have Montana. And Montana has started building. So Montana will be a problem. And I could see here they've only built pretty cleanly. I don't know why there's a second building here because that's a single resource province. He probably hasn't watched this video. But this is easily defendable because if we look at the roads from Montana to South Dakota, there's just one road. I can guard one province. I can prep for it. Right before I take it, I can start building forts, which we will talk about soon. And that's this is not a bad way of going. I don't want to go and invade an overbuilder because an overbuilder is going to do really good in the early game and then start petering out. And a lot of things they'll, they'll overbuild on is forts. So let's talk about forts. Now here in Carlton, I go to the construction tab and I click fort. This is a fort level one. What does a fort level one give me? Well, fort level one gives me 5% morale development. Remember we discussed morale. We're at 70% right now. This would get us at 75%, but this gets us to that target morale. And all our targets have been close to 100 right now. So I don't need to worry about building something like a fort to give my morale up. But a garrison, a garrison, I'll take 50% less damage. And that's great. And as you build forts, that amount compounds, and it's amazing. I think you get to about 88%. Now, if I click my army here, the second infantry division, if they were in conflict right now and they were the attackers, they would do 27.1 damage. If they were the defenders, they would do 33.9. One of these numbers is higher than the other. And I'm just going to say, because I don't have my calculator, it's the defense one. Now, if I have a fort and they're taking half that amount of damage, their 10 infantry are attacking my 10 infantry. I'm defending. They're attacking. That's a very small number. That's about 16 or 17 damage. I'm, I'm doubling in how much I'm giving damage to them and how much I'm receiving, which is a great way of fighting. And that's why I don't invade overbuilders. So for all you overbuilders, you're geniuses because I don't invade you. I don't invade you yesterday, Russia, and I definitely don't invade you tomorrow. Now with a wild card like South Dakota, I'll need to move troops, but I'll need to move them in a way that doesn't raise suspicion. So how am I going to do that? So I can double click everything. You can see I have a hundred infantry here and I can move everyone right at once, but I don't want to do that. I want to move here, which is out of line of sight here and here. Now why there? Because the vision, he won't see me coming. He won't see a, a buildup happen. I can move all of them here and then attack. So he falls. Same here. I'm going to Moorhead. 
move here, and move here. Now, against Russia tomorrow, I need to keep defenses. So I'm going to split these guys in half, which is a very risky thing to do. You know, seven and seven would be such a better number, but he really can't see anything I'm doing because we don't have that line of sight. Remember, clear, shaded, dark. I can't see that. He can't see me. And it'll be a long time coming. So I'm really betting that I'll get more reinforcements to assist me if he does show up. But overbuilders aren't always the same as wild cards. They really want to win that early game. And they're okay with sacrificing the late game. Now, how is he sacrificing the late game? He's sacrificing the late game because if you look at the resources that I have, I'm not spending everything that I have. I'm not just clicking the buy button on construction this, construction that. I'm maintaining what I have. I'm keeping it because after a while, we're going to have to start industrializing. So how do we start industrializing? So in day two, tomorrow, I'm allowed to build harbors. Harbors give you a 25% re a 25% resource production, an embarkment time of landing and unlanding your your men, and morale development. And as the game progresses, you're going to have to start building harbors. You're going to have to start building rail railroads. Railroads do 33%. They have an upkeep though. 500 coal which is why i think coal is a very underutilized resource in the stock market and your land movement triples along with morale development and as the game progresses when i'm at day 20 nearly every province here will have a railroad and carlton will have a harbor also and you have to do that else you'll turn into spain as I showed before, Spain had 55% morale. Spain is dying. I'm going to win that game because Spain doesn't like to click the railroad and harbor button. Russia tomorrow is not building railroads or harbors. Why do I know that, even though he has so many unknowns? Because it's not available right now. Harbors are at day two. Railroads are at day five. Now, as the game progresses, we're at day one. When we reach day three, you'll see more than half of this board, half of the human players turn into AIs. And it's very important to notice that, to realize that, to check that. And I can tell if their username, number, 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 you know, nine times out of 10, they will turn into an AI. Some good players do hide behind that username to mask themselves. They'd be like, oh, I'm a username. Don't, don't think of anything I'm doing, but then they'll end up doing great because they're being sneaky. Once they turn into an AI, you need to keep tabs on if they ever come back into the game. But as long as they're an AI, they won't attack you. Now, why won't they attack you? They won't attack you. I'm going to show this example from the AI North Dakota. I'm going to click the computer icon, and here's the person's profile. You can see here my popularity with them is 93%. Now, I can't tell you what number it needs to be to be attacked, but it's under 30%, and it's more likely single digits and that we are far off from that. And that's how you know a robot will never attack you. Now, how do you get your popularity up? You get your popularity up by buying in the stock market, buying and selling. As the AI buys and sells and you accept those offers, you initiate those offers and they accept them, your popularity goes up. Your popularity goes up when they get attacked and you're at war with the person that's attacking them. Your popularity goes up. Your popularity goes up when you go to the diplomacy tab and you click provinces 
And you could see here, I've shared map with all of the AIs. You could see the computer player right here. I've shared the map. I've given them, oh, forgot Cuba. True American right there. Um, I've shown them my map. I've given them free access to walk through my territories without declaring war. And that can be very risky if you give that to a human. But I know no human player can be these AIs. Here, now we're at 10 provinces, so now we're going to human players. Here, I click this, or hover over this icon, and you can see it says player. These are all players. You can see here in Alaska, they have a little flag right here. What does that flag mean? Let's click it. So he, Alaska has created a coalition called the Swaggers. He's chosen a flag. Let's show the power of coalition to the world. Now, coalitions can be great. In most games, you can only have three people in a coalition. If I wanted to have an easy win, I would convince Russia tomorrow to join a coalition with me, then I'm 100% sure I could dedicate all my infantry to attacking South Dakota. But I love solo victories. I will join a coalition when I see that there's no chance of me winning without another human to save me. Coalitions can also be fun. If you're, if you're winning the game and there's three people in a coalition, like here, you could look down in Mexico. You could see Kohula is in a coalition of the leaders of Central America. And you can see South Mexico is also in the leaders of Central America. And you could see Central Mexico as the leaders of Central America. Now, these three people are easily going to dominate this area. If I was West Mexico, if I was Chihuahua, Maybe if I was Texas, I would need to join a coalition a, as soon as possible, or I'm going to get overrun. Losing's not the end of the world. You just replay the beginning of this video, and you'll see exactly how to start a new game. I want to discuss the newspaper. So here, the top icon says newspaper. I click it, and you'll see all these different things. It's in day one, it teaches you the game rules that were set by this game. South Mexico made an independent post about their new coalition arising. And you can see all the players who joined the game. Now at the end, they'll give you two articles every day. And it's r random. Today's one is Wealthiest Nations which everyone just started the game. So you could see everyone has the same 1.42% of the total wealth of the game. And the most dreaded nations. Now dread is the reverse of popularity. So someone who has a high dread has a low popularity. And again, since this is day one, we're all the same. I don't know how they decided New Brunswick is number one, but I don't blame them. It's New England. So here is an example of a game where I am the Ottoman Empire. You can see me as number three with the largest economy. And my enemies, West Algeria and West Mali, create more resources than I do. I'm very upset by that. But scrolling a few days in the newspaper, you scroll by the arrow button here, day 29, day 28, Going all the way to the bottom, you could see who has the mightiest army. Well, I have the mightiest army. Enemy is number two, my allies number three, and my enemies number two. Sorry, number four. And that shows you I still have a fighting chance here. To combine, we still have a bigger force than they do. Scrolling again, you could see the most dreaded nation, which is West Mali. I totally agree with that. But more importantly, the most efficient economy. Now, an efficient economy is one where you are producing more than you consume. And you can see I'm number one there. I'm 20.2 compared to 
number two, which is West Molly, 16.7. So again, that gives me hope. And the newspaper is a great resource. You can also see battle statistics. Here you can see West Molly lost no one since the beginning of his war with my ally, and my ally lost 24,000 units. Bad day. I'm also hurting, but it is what it is. And that's the point of the newspaper. It's an underutilized resource. You have no idea why they're giving out free information about you, about your enemy, and the comparisons between that. Now, you can also see who's number one. So let's go back to the current day. You can see West Mali's number one, my enemy. West Algeria is number two, also my enemy. Me, the Ottoman Empire, and South Arabia. And there's accumulation of points. Now, what do these points mean? These points, where you can see here I'm in second place, I have 858 out of 1,500. That's what I need to win. That's what I need to win for a coalition victory. Where if I was playing a solo victory, I would need 1,000 points. But this is counting my ally. So it's not like I can give up on my ally and get close to a solo victory. Rebellions. You could see here in Tangiers that when I click this icon here, the morale is turning to 50 and there's no warning sign. Now, what does a warning sign look like? Well, let's go to Rabat. Here you could see a green warning sign. If I don't have someone guarding this, there's a percent chance it will revolt. Now, if I leave Rabat, you can see it's red. Red means there's a chance it will revolt. So as long as you have the green, you're good to go. Now, what is the chance of uprising here? It's 15%. What does 15% mean? 15% means when day change happens, so 15% chance that this province will turn to the nearest, most popular other country that isn't me. It'll go to Spain. Now, how do you maximize the amount of infantry, right? I have over 100 units right here who are bombarding this fort in Fez. Do I move all of them there to stop it? Do I move these 11? Let's figure that out. So it's 11%. Sorry, it's 15%. I grab this army and I split it and I move here until the strength says 15.7 strength. I move back here and it goes to green. Here you could see that the seven infantry are in Rabat and it went back to green. It's a way of utilizing the most efficient amount of troops to a given area. Now you don't have to waste so many men holding so many provinces as you expand. Now here we could see a conflict going on. I have 183 infantry, completely overkill. You could see I've lost one infantry during this fight. This fights with an armored car, and there used to be two infantry with that armored car. In about 19 minutes and 50 seconds, another battle will go. You can see here on the stats, if I'm attacking, I do 85.5 damage to land units. You can see the little helmet. That's what that means. If I'm defending, it's 106.9. My enemy is 2 and 4. So they're dealing me four damage. I'll take the hit on that. That number is a percentage of the unit stats based on the morale. So over time, they will lose morale. Here you can see an army that's about 50% morale. I was raiding all along here, and after a while, I got tired. You can see the health bar, it's about 50%, the morale bar. I need to bring them to a higher morale province. So a higher morale province during day change, the morale units, which is infantry and cavalry, will migrate towards that province. So here at my capital in Vienna, it's 
So anyone here will migrate towards 100%. Down south in North Africa, I have 34% with a migrating target morale of 50%. I need to build infrastructure here because I need, I can't have men coming across the sea and coming back to heal up. I need them to heal up on this continent. Who knows if they have submarines, Navy is not going to be discussed in this. Besides this point, we're having a little battle here and I think it's going fine. Their cruisers are shooting my army. My army is shooting back with artillery. There's also submarines. There's also battleships, battleships, which is big boy cruisers. Now let's talk about sacking a capital. So Spain, as you all know, is in the Iberian Peninsula. Spain's capital used to be in Madrid. I took it. When I took Spain's capital, I got a morale boost in every province. And he got a morale decrease in every province. And that was one of the reasons why his morale is now at 53%. But he rebuilt his capital over here. So when you're about to lose your capital, you need to build a new capital. Ideally, you'll see it coming. You'll start building one right away. I'm also playing as Russia. And as you all know, Russia's over here. I started in St. Petersburg as my capital, but I moved it down to Vienna. And I chose Vienna because it's centrally located. You cannot invade it from the coast immediately. You'll have to go through another province. And it's a way of defending your most important building in the game. And that is the main part of a capital. But why is a capital important? So if I go to the outer reaches of Russia, and I click on the morale icon, you can see distance to capital, 1.7 days, negative 26 morale. Now that is a lot. That's problematic. I'm actually losing resources in this province. And I'm, I've already built a railroad and I'm starting to build fortresses because they're cheaper than factories around this area to boost up that morale. Morale is such a huge part of this game. Spain would do so much better if they would just hit that harbor button, hit the, hit the fortress button, and definitely hit that railroad button. Now let's talk about factories. So moving up here, you could see I'm building a level one factory at a double resource. Here you could see I have a level four factory at a double resource. I'm not gonna click anymore, but you could assume how important it is that you do not build a factory in a single resource province. Now, why is that? So here, as you have double the resources, the percentage of extra resources produced is doubled. 33% of a doubled resource is, is a, an efficient use of your resources. And that is why it's very important You'll do so great in this game if you just deal with double resource provinces. Just build those up. Build harbors, build recruitment offices, build railways at a single province resource. And build everything else in a double, forts not included. I want to discuss attacking. Now, Supremacy 1914 is a game based on World War One, And attacking is not as advantageous as defending. So what do I mean by that? Now you could see my 8th Infantry Division here. You could see they have attack strength of 27.1. You could see that if I were to invade South Dakota, their defensive strength would be 33.9. Now, their number is much higher than mine. So they will win, and they will also win in a greater way. 
So how do you attack properly in a World War One game where defense has the advantage? Now, one way you do it is through grouping your armies like this. I've control clicked five groups of 50. I move into attack. I hit OK. It doesn't declare war. Then I hit the delay button and the game has already figured out how long it takes for all of them to show up if I hit that delay button. I can also manually move it, but in this scenario, it doesn't work. So I hit set delay, and now what happens? You can see the furthest unit, the 5th Infantry Division, is now moving. Here are the 6th Infantry Division. You can see in 16 minutes, 21 seconds, they will move. The 7th, 4 hours and 21 minutes. 10th, 5 hours and 24 minutes. And this can give you a, I need to attack now. I don't want to wait until the, until the next day, the next morning, after work, blah, 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 to start an attack. And why did I choose 50 units? So I chose 50 units because the game is designed for only 50 units to be fighting at one time. Now, the first 20 units will attack at full strength. They pick the best units for the best attack at that given situation. There's land, there's naval, there's air. I'm not discussing naval and air right now. But they choose the best units. And after 21 to 50, it goes on a gradient, goes on a slope on the damage value where 51 units will do zero damage. And there's so many times where I've seen people just lob all their men in single file and they just get beat up. And that is one of the single most annoying things that players do. They just let me win by doing that. And that's why I'm making this video. And there's one final part to everything. There's diplomacy. You can talk to people. You can message them. Hey, look, I want to message Kentucky. I click Kentucky. I type, hello, let us be friends. Smiley face. And, you know, if I wanted to be friends, I would hit the send button right here. But I don't want to. And that is the majority of this game. You figure out those basics, you figure out producing units, only in the double resources, conserving your resources, conserving your morale, checking your morale. Whenever you have a problem, go back to this video, you'll see exactly what I'm saying. But the last part is this game is on desktop, this game is on Steam, this game is on mobile. And I like to have a good routine. When I play this game and my routine is in the morning, I start my coffee. I take my chihuahua to go to the bathroom outside. I check my garden. I check my honeybees. I come back with my computer already turned on, already set to play this, already have the audio, the video. And I set up my strategy for that day. My job is pretty convenient where I can check it on mobile throughout the day, but you should make sure that you can check it during your lunch break. If you're a normal person who has a lunch break, that is the second time you should be checking this. You should be checking your movements in the morning. You should be checking it at lunchtime and you should be checking it when you come home from work. It Once you get used to this, it's only 15 minutes out of the day. The previous games I showed you I'm in intense battles. It is much more quick. It's much more intense. I cannot stress how important it is to be checking it more often, but I plan those fights. I chose those times where I'm free to plan an attack. And when it comes to nighttime, I'll plan to defend. I won't do an invasion going to bed. 
I won't start something. I won't start an air campaign to bomb South Dakota right before I go to bed because South Dakota could have airports and fighters ready to intercept me and I won't be there to look at it. That's not smart tactics. You always should be slow and cautious as you progress. You should be looking towards being available when you are the aggressor and attacking someone. And that is such a huge thing in this game. I've won so many times just based on that one fact of someone starting something where that person didn't realize they were about to attack my fort. And they could have stopped right right here, right? I'm going to hit here, add target. We're going backwards, right? Instead of attacking me here, you could attack and move right here to this spot before you start the fight, if you're so eager to start a fight. Because you may not realize how quickly I can send troops to this point to reinforce it. And then the math's not on your side. And you don't want to be in that situation. Watching this video and taking in the majority of the content, you will be a beginner player. A beginner player can win against the vast majority of people but this is a growing step towards something else. And now I'm shelling for Squid University. Now we need to talk about, if you watch my other videos, you'll see how to play as an intermediate player and you'll see how to play as an expert. And that change between an expert and an intermediate player is an intermediate player knows exactly what an expert does, but an expert has a build order like any strategy game at day this I do that at day this I do this thing when this happens I immediately respond with this the intermediate players like well let's see if this works out let's see if this shows the results that I want that's a long process in any game where you move from beginner intermediate and expert it could be Starcraft, it could be Supremacy 1914, it could be Total War. It doesn't matter. And that's that. This is Squid University. This is Professor Squid. Professor Squid's out. So now we're at the bonus section. And at the bonus section, I'm going to show you how I take out South Dakota. Now I've moved 40 infantry here to land here right when day change happens. When day change happens, I will get more health and I won't lose health as I cross the border. Same for this army group down here. The one on the top, I'm gonna to call army group A. The one on the bottom, I'm gonna call army group B. All I did was click them both, control click, hit the delay button, and then set my time. This is when day change will happen, roughly. Now, I've gone to the stock market, and I bought a bunch of wood, because it was much cheaper than this. It was almost three or four per wood, which is a great number. Just like I talked before, iron ore is more expensive than lumber most times, grain is more expensive than fish. You can see the difference here, 13.6, 5.4. And then energy, once it becomes more needed, will show oil as the dominant one. And coal, not so much. Now I bought a bunch of lumber because it was cheap, but it also lets me divert more resources to iron ore. Now I've changed it here. You could see how I could buy the cheaper one, use it as my cons daily cons consumption, and still win out by grabbing, by pro just producing more iron ore. Now, let's talk about South Dakota and why my previous assumptions 
yesterday were right. So here, let's start with our first human player, Russia Tomorrow. You can see Russia Tomorrow has built so many buildings. Russia Tomorrow is not at war with any countries. So Russia Tomorrow could be a threat. But I'm, I'm gambling here. I'm betting they won't show up and attack me here. The rest of the countries besides South Dakota is an AI. Now let's talk about South Dakota. So South Dakota still has not built a single building, which is great. But since I've already established that South Dakota is a wild card, he's attacked this other human player who's also not doing anything. You can see here the smoke rising and you can see the color change. He's taken these two provinces. Now you may be saying, okay, you start with 100 infantry. He hasn't built any recruitment offices, so he's not having any more infantry to be produced. What is his numbers right now? Well, let's look at him. Here, you can see he's at war with one country. I'm going to click at war with Nebraska. We knew that. Here we can see it's aver his average morale went down because he took a new province. Let's look at that really quickly. You could see here that the morale bar has dropped from 70% to 25%. When you take a new province, it'll drop down to 25%. You can also see that he has the green arrow or the green exclamation point. Now going back to South Dakota's profile, we could see his kill ratio. So you could see here he, for every one unit he lost, the D, He's killed 1.19 units. So he's killed 25 of Nebraska's army. So Nebraska now has 75 units. And he has lost 21. So now I know that he has 79 units. So now I know that he's losing men. I feel more confident about invading him. I'm worried that maybe Montana might take advantage of that. But I would really want to take this province and start fortifying it as soon as possible. My forces are landing at the border. I've seen no movement from South Dakota. South Dakota has taken another province from Nebraska. And now it's go time. So what is go time? Go time is me attacking here you could see army group B moving through this province see the road moving to that province and moving to the capital it says they'll be there in about 23 hours they'll get there a little quicker when I take the province because my movement speed will change here with movement speed you could see their movement is 36 if I scroll down to the infantry tab you can see friendly and, and enemy territory. So their movement speed is going to drastically change. But when I retake the province, it'll go back to 36. So don't always trust this number, but it's a good guide. Now I'm trying to get to their capital before day change, so I don't need to leave any soldiers here in case they, there's a revolt. As we progress, I will take one unit and move it to... Wakanda, Army Group A, now they're going here, I'm going to move them up to take out that 10 infantry, it's always good just to kill them while they're separated, and then move there. Now look at that, I have an Army Group B, 97.7 .7 attack, versus the 34.9. Their health points is around 130, mine's around 680. And that's how you do an attack in this game. And if more people did that, you could get so much further and everyone would be happy. Now, what's also interesting is the cap, the double resource provinces, Wheaton Valley and Bemidji, already recruited the first infantry unit. You can see I have six here now. I'm going to move one of them over here. 
And this one, I guess I'll just move him right here. By the time he gets here, it'll still be, I'll have taken it before the capital's taken. And that works out perfectly. And then these guys will be destroyed. Now in my first fight against a human player, I don't officially declare war. Because as I showed before, and I'll show you now, they're considered friendly territory as I'm walking through them. I'm going to get there a lot quicker if I don't declare war. I'll start losing and getting a negative 65% movement speed. So in the beginning, I'll be more tricky. This affects my popularity because it's a surprise attack. If you want to invade someone, like pretend I want to take over this northern Wisconsin area, before I started, I would go to diplomacy, show them in diplomacy. Here's North Wisconsin diplomacy. I would hit embargo. And the more days that I've embargoed them, and with the fact that once I start a war, I hit the declare war button, my popularity won't be hit. Here, their popularity is 90%. That's really great. You, I've had it sometimes where I've only lost a few points compared to, what, 15%? with a surprise attack or more. You can see I've lost two units here. You can see South Dakota has lost six units. And that's because I attacked with a greater force. You can see now that he is responding. And I don't really know what this wild card South Dakota has in mind. So what I've done is I've told my army group B to march right here. I'll be back in the morning. If they all stack right here, guess what? Army group A is going to come around. The goal here is if he does consolidate his forces, that I'm not the one who initiates the attack. I need to be defending. Here we are at the next day. You can see it was very smart of me to delay the attack. Sitting here is not too bad. Meanwhile, my other army is moving into the capital. I'll again be cautious and move right before the capital before attacking. If he moves his army here, I move my army there. Day two is already passed and you can see I'm building a harbor. My armor car has been built, and my balloon has been built. I built one more of each, and then I'll stop. So I've taken the capital. I took it in time before day change. And you could see I didn't have to station anyone here. The morale's above 25%. So I don't have to worry about rebellions. The shock of my invasion made this human player run away, give up. He did spend gold, and now I don't spend gold. I don't care if you spend gold. It's your money. I don't need to spend my money to win this game. But he spent gold on a fortress, and he positioned his troops here. He didn't even click right on a couple of them but I'm just going to sit here and let him kind of just peter away. You could see his morale is lower. His morale is going to keep trending to the province that he's in. So I have to worry about that. But my goal is just to get back to my main provinces that have high morale. And their morale actually went up because I took that capital. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to just double click an in infantry. Everyone who's in line of sight will go right here. Now this armored car will move around and assist this group because they're guarding the double resources here and I want these double resources too. I don't really care about single province resources unless they're strategically available. And so that is it. That is everything here. 
I could show you how an AI will react, but you could see here with Army Group A, 105 defense. His army, if he attacks, 87.8. If this 57 group attacks my 40, I'll win. And I'm building, since I've built recruiting offices here, I'm going to start getting more infantry. So it's going to work out. Taking all of this so early in the game is, is going to get me ahead. So lastly, let's talk about the future. So I make videos fighting human players as teams, solo, anything that's interesting because this is not an interesting fight, but so many people can't even do this. But what is interesting is what could be happening in the future. So not tomorrow, but Russia tomorrow has joined a coalition, the true North with West Ontario, the Scotch, and Death in Saskatchewan. So these three are in a coalition together. And that's why I'm building forts along my border. I've already built level one forts. I'm going to keep an eye on them. Manitoba is, is taking out Winnipeg slowly, but it's happening. Russia tomorrow hasn't moved, but I have a balloon and I can see their movements. Here's Manitoba sitting at their capital. Here's Manitoba. Here's West Ontario, Russia tomorrow, West Ontario. No movements over here because this balloon is giving me a line of sight. That's why you want balloons. That's it. If this was interesting, watch more of my videos, like, subscribe, all the fun stuff. So now anyone who's gotten past this point is officially a squid boy. Congratulations. You've graduated squid university. Uh, I will send your cap and gown in the mail. Please don't give me your mailing address and I'll talk to you squid boys later. Bye. A unique and lesser known aspect of World War I, the involvement of squids in the trenches. These amazing creatures disrupted the monotony of trench warfare, distracting soldiers and providing occasional amusement amidst the horrors of battle. Squid.